Right now, moments before the first pitch, it's the traditional first ball throwing and a switch on it tonight as we go to game seven. The president of the Red Sox, Mrs. Jean Yawkey, the chairman of the board of the New York Mets, Nelson Doubleday, with Nelson throwing the ball to Rich Gedman and Mrs. Yawkey throwing the ball to Gary Carter. Now let's get to the lineup. For the Red Sox, no changes. Wade Boggs leading off at third and Marty Barrett at second base. Bill Buckner will be at first and Jim Rice in the cleanup spot and left. Dwight Evans in right field. He'll be followed by Rich Gedman behind the plate. Dave Henderson in center field. Rich Owen at shortstop and the pitcher will be Bruce Hurt. Here's the way the Mets stack up defensively. And there are some changes. Kevin Mitchell is in left field. Mookie Wilson is in center field. Strawberry is in right field, as you heard McNamara say. Dykstra and Backman are out of the lineup. The infield, Knight Santana, Tuffle Hernandez, Carter behind the plate, Ron Darling on the mound. Ron Darling, a 15 game winner during the year, is 1 and 1 in the World Series. He was 1 and 0 in the playoffs. And as you might remember, in the series, he has not allowed an earned run to Boston in 14 consecutive innings. Wade Bond, Marty Barrett, and Bill Buckner, and here we go. Ball one. John Kibler, Jim Evans, Harry Wendelstedt, Joe Brinkman working the lines with Ed Montague and Dale Ford on the foul line. Right. One and one. Backing out as an airplane flies overhead. We should have a lot of that tonight. The pattern, evidently, for the first time, will bring planes almost constantly directly over Shay. One and one. Ball two. There is no breeze to speak of. The flag hanging limply in center field. Remember, that's how Hernandez, uh, he figures that the breeze, when they're overhead, blows to left field. Now back. Two and two. On a somewhat breathless night in New York. It's the final game of the year. Two and two to Bob. Ball three. Darling doesn't have any trick pitches. It's a fastball, a curve. He does have that split finger fastball, but he does not throw it hard. He kind of uses it as an off speed pitch. So three and two, the count to Wade Bond. Line drive at Santana. So Wade Boggs hits it right on the button, but right at Santana. One down. And second baseman Marty Barrett coming up. Barrett is hit in all six with four RBI. Bill Buckner. Ball one. Walt Reniak coaching at first. Renee Latchman around at third for Boston. In there. One of the things that has bothered the Red Sox considerably throughout the series leaving men on base it's interesting they have left 63 men on if they leave nine more tonight they will have tied a World Series record of 72 established by the Mets back in 1973. What might be a factor too is Mookie Wilson in center field then plays very shallow as compared to Dykstra. One and one in there. So the chance begin early tonight. The last game of the year, and they're determined to be heard. And that's hit in the air to shallow right field, but Strawberry is there.
Two down in the first inning, and here is Bill Buckner. He is getting, in some areas, a standing ovation, but you can understand the reasoning behind it. Two down, bases empty, first inning, no score. On deck, Jim Rice. Strike, outside corner. Now the chant is Billy, Billy. Breaking ball, ground foul, and the count 0 and 2. Just on the strength of what we've seen, it uh, seems like Carter and Darling have picked the fastball, the one that tails away as the best pitch so far. He's really spotted it. That's the first breaking ball he's thrown. 0 and 2 to Buckner. Join us late. Wade Boggs lined out to short. Marty Barrett flied to right as Bruce Hurst and Don Baylor look on. Fastball sliced down the left field line, and that one is going to land foul. Buckner halfway to second base. They'll have a long walk back. The infield was covered, but watching Buckner around first base, he kind of slipped. He's, you can see he's got those high toppers on, but uh, the infield was covered, and it appears to be in pretty good shape. But as he rounds it, he does a little bit of a slip here, right there. The so Buckner comes back. One ball and two strikes to count. Two out, first inning, no score. Rice on deck. The final baseball game of the year. There's a hopper into right field, base hit for Buckner. So a two out single to right by Bill Buckner will bring up Jim Rice. Seem to reach for it and just plugs the gap between first and second. Interesting, too, looking at that Buckner as he was swinging, Hernandez started to go the other way. I think Keith was expecting the ball to be pulled between him and the bag as opposed to in the hole. And here is Rice. Out in front of it, he was guessing fastball on the count on one. In the dirt, knocked down by Carter, and of course Buckner's not about to gamble on the base pass. And Carter did a good job of shifting. He's ready to move. Just the tip of the glove got it, and as long as you keep that ball in front of you, no one is going to move, especially Buckner. So Buckner at first held on by Hernandez. Two out in the first inning, no score. One and one. The count to Jim Rice with Dwight Evans on deck. Fouled away off first base out of play. Came inside, hit him on the thumbs. Rice is using that choked up grip that he's gone to just a bit. And when you ask him about it, there you see it. He says, I just want to drive the ball. I want to hit it hard. I'm quicker with the bat when I choke up a little bit. One 
two. Foul off. Ron Darling pitching on four days rest because of rain. And Bruce Hurst because of the rain starting over Dennis Oil Can Boy. Got that left hand wrapped, keeping it warm. One ball, two strikes to Jim Rice. And that's line to right. Strawberry going to his left, backhand. Sox nothing, Mets coming up. Dykstra and Backman sit down, so the Mets line up with Wilson, Tuffle, and Hernandez, Carter, Strawberry, and Knight, Mitchell, Santana, and Darling, and Bruce Hurst, a 13 game winner during the year, 3 0 in postseason games, a brilliant earned run average of 1.7. And a ground ball to the right side to Marty Barrett. One pitch, one away. Take a look at the defense for the Red Sox. Rice, Henderson, and Evans in the outfield. It's the same as it's been. Boggs, Owen, Barrett, Buckner, Gedman behind the plate, and Bruce Hurst with that good curveball, that big overhand curveball. He changes speeds on it, a fork ball and a fastball, and he has been using them all. Hurst has had trouble with the hitter coming up, Tim Tuffle. Double is four for seven against hers, including two singles, a double, and a home run. You might remember the home run went to right field in Fenway Park. Tim, whose error contributed heavily to the winning run scoring in game one. Four one. Following couple, Keith Hernandez. One and all. Right. When he spots that pitch on that outside corner, he is just doubly tough because it just makes his other two pitches, the slow curveball and the fork ball, more effective. Fouled at the plate and the count one and two. I guess it figured we'd have a game like Saturday night when you realize that the Red Sox won 19 games in their last at bats, including the playoff. The Mets had 39 come from behind, then they had three in the playoffs with Houston, and then Saturday night. Uh, this should go to the wire. One and two. Two and two. And you could just as well change the name of the bottom of that sheet to Sox in Boston. Popped in the air on the right side, and it's Marty Barrett. As a ball club, if you're the Red Sox, you're looking for a strong inning from your pitcher, much like Darning gave the Mets, and so far that's what Hurst has done. And with two out, here is Keith Hernandez. Another interesting aspect to the game tonight, it is conceivable that the long man, the so called long man in the bullpen tonight, would be Dwight Gooden for the Mets and Dennis Oil Can Boyd for the Red Sox. And Roger Clemens said before the game, just talking to him, he showed me where he had the blister. He said, I can go if they need me. Gooden looking on with Santana and Howard Johnson in the dugout. Ball one to Keith Hernandez. Hernandez, a member of the 82 Cardinal Club that was down three games to two and won it. And he's trying to repeat it. You can see him shaking his head as another plane flies overhead. They really sound like they're low. I can see where your concentration would be broken. One ball and no strikes. Breaking ball strike and the count one and one. Bruce Hurst, if you throw out the last start he made, that was the game after the Red Sox had clinched, you get an indication of how well he's been pitching. That's line to center. Henderson will flag it, and the inning is over. Hurst has made 11 consecutive quality starts, and at the end of an inning, no score. The 
almost hypnotic stare of Jim Rice. If he looked back, he thinks about the 75 World Series where he had a broken hand and failed to play. And of course, he's been looking ahead, trying to figure it out ever since Saturday morning. He's talking to Tony Armas. Just watching, it looked like he was talking about going the other way, an inside out swing, and Armas seemed to be talking about the defense, and that's we're using against Rice. Remember, in the first inning, the Sox hit the ball pretty hard. Boggs went the other way and lined to Santana. Rice went the other way and lined to Strawberry. Buckner pulled for a base hit to right. Barrett flied to right. Here's Dwight Evans, Rich Gedman, and then Dave Henderson. Second inning, no score. Breaking ball up, ball one. Top of the second. Fouled off. One ball, one strike. Count one and two to Dwight Evans. Evans was saying that Saturday night's game ranked right up there with game six of the World Series. Well, that really puts it in his spot. In 1975. Like Dwight was on deck when Carlton Fisk hit the home run, as he remembered. One and two. Sink or miss. It's pretty apparent very early that Darling's going to go with that sinker, that good hard fastball that he's throwing, because a couple times that Gary's put down the breaking ball, he is, just shakes it off. Two balls and two strikes to Dwight Evans. Fouled at the plate. That's the way it looks to the hitter, and there's the rotation. Dwight well, just did get a piece of it, and the count stays two and two. Fastball missed. Well, he goes all the way. First, slicing down the line. Hernandez on the tarp roller to get a look, and it's way back. The great delight in this game, Vin. It's the seventh game of the World Series, so much riding on it. Yet, as you look with our center field shot, you'll still see that the same signs used on the playground. One was a fastball, two's the curve, and three's the split finger. Three and two to Dwight. Deep left center field. That one might go all the way. It is gone. Home run, Dwight Evans. It was a fastball, and Evans really jumped on it. He was a little bit out on front, in front on that ball he fouled off, but this one with the swing, he timed it perfectly and drove it a long way. Dwight Evans, second home run of the series. And his seventh run batted in, and it's the Red Sox who score first and lead one to nothing. The batter will be the left-hand hitting catcher, Rich Gedman, after we take one more look. And, of course, Evans, a great low ball hitter, and he got that ball down around the knees. Ball one to Gedman. Away, one ball, one strike. So Dwight Evans with a big home run to the back row of the bleachers in left center. Gedman fouls it away and the count one and two. 
they're going to make him get him and chase the bad ball, changing speeds on him. It'll be interesting to see what uh, Carter and Darling do with this pitch. It's one ball and uh, two strikes. He's got that split finger. Maybe try to bounce one up and see what happens. Gedman followed by Dave Henderson. And as you can see, things come tumbling down. Well, they're portable stands, and obviously when the foul ball gets there, everybody leans, and there it goes. Fortunately, it doesn't appear anybody got hurt. Time out for a moment while they restore that. So we can tell you that that home run by Dwight Evans is the ninth home run in this World Series. What makes it interesting? All in the road ballpark. The Red Sox have now hit four home runs in the series, and the Mets have hit five. So as Tom Seaver sits quietly eating sunflower seeds, they prepare the wall in right field, and time is out. One nothing Red Sox, top of the second inning. Talk about sunflower seeds. I thought it was kind of interesting. Only in the World Series coverage do you get it where they had psychologists try to figure out why ball players chew tobacco, chew gum, chew sunflower seeds. I can't understand why they chew tobacco. I wish they'd stop that. But the sunflower seeds, they had all kinds of reasons for that. But only in the World Series did they emphasize something like that. Meanwhile, the walls come tumbling down, so time out of Shay. You might wonder about that rain out that we had. Going back to the history books in 1911, if you can imagine, between games three and four of the World Series, there was a six day rain delay. The 1911 World Series finished on October the 26th. Then, of course, in 1962, you might remember, in San Francisco, game six was rained out three times. And 1975, game six was rained out three times. And in going back through the history books, yet another footnote to Saturday night's game. Game six of the 1986 World Series will be listed as the greatest comeback game in World Series history. No team down by two runs scored three in its last at bat until Saturday night. Dwight Evans. You remember against Jack Mars opening day in Detroit. This is the way his season began. What a way to start. You hit the first pitch of the season out for a home run. And now Dwight opening up the second inning for the Red Sox hits another home run and Boston leads one other. And he's accustomed to hitting them in another park. Okay, the wall has been secured, and here is Gedman with a count of one ball and two strikes. And that's a drive into right center field. Strawberry going back to the wall. At the wall, leaps in the air. One hands it. No, he missed it. The right hand of Dale Ford started up and then circled to indicate home run. And Strawberry coming with an inch, it's gone, and the Sox lead two to nothing. We've seen a number of these plays. He gets the glove on it. His glove is over the fence. It looks like he's going to rob Getman as he finds the fence of the home run. He gets above it. It hits the glove, and then his arm appears to hit the fence. Over it goes. He was looking for it and realizes he doesn't have it. We saw Henderson do that in the playoffs. We saw Dwight Evans do it, and now here's Strawberry. So it is two to nothing Boston on back to back home run by Dwight Evans and Rich Gedman. The batter is Dave Henderson who takes ball one. For Ron Darling his string of consecutive scoreless innings ends shockingly after 15. Strawberry really thought he had that but so did he I. grabbed nothing. Foul back two and one to count. This was the non catch of Dwight Evans in Boston. Got his glove on it, arm hits the wall, and out it goes. So we've seen that three times Henderson, Evans, and now Strawberry. Two and one. 
three and one. So the Red Sox hit the ball hard in the first inning and they hit two out in the second inning and there's ball four to Henderson. Darling has now walked ten men in the series and Mel Stottlemyre going out to talk to him to see if he can find the solution. Spike Owen will be the batter. Nobody out. Pretty apparent why Stottlemyre is going out there just to settle him down because back to back home runs and Hey, that'll get you to thinking. It'll get you to aiming, and all Stoudemire wants to do is, hey, look, okay, so they got the two runs. Let's get let's get settled down here and and go back to work. You can see by the reaction on Gedman's home run that uh, it was a bit of a shock as far as Darling was concerned. Strawberry looked like he was going to make the play. He gets there. He knows exactly where the fence is. He gets above it. Off his glove, and then he looks in his glove. He thought he had it. Oh, he says, but it's a home run. Ron Darling gave up 21 home runs during the regular year, so he stung back to back. And now with Henderson on and nobody out, Spike Owen is the batter. Night cheating in at third base. And with Owen, they can certainly put a play on because he can handle that bat. And for the historian, the last time, 1981, Guerrero and Yeager of Ron Guidry, Dodgers versus Yankees. Right. Mike having a good series. As a quick look down at Renee Latchman, Henderson held on by Keith Hernandez. Two nothing Red Sox, top of the second inning. Darling has a good, quick move. When he throws the first base with his good move, it is quick. He can pick you off. No balls, one strike. That's in there. The scouts rate Darling as being quick to first, but pretty slow coming to the plate. Darling is considered a good fielder. 0 oh 2 the count. Henderson with a walk at first. If anyone wondered with the fog here tonight and no wind whether the ball will carry that question has been answered by Evans and Gedman. And that's a little pop fly to Santana. One out in the top of the second inning two to nothing Boston and Bruce Hurst coming out. First, you remember, and he was very good natured about it, in taking his at bats here against Darling, struck out three times. In fact, the last time he came up in that game, there were a couple of runners aboard, and he said, Gary Carter and the plate umpire were laughing, and Hurst said, Hey, be serious up here. They laughed some more as he struck out a third time. But the Mets now are not looking laughs, they're looking bunt. And there it is. And it's overrun by Knight, picked up and thrown by Darling for the out. Knight looked back at the turf as if it had done him wrong. And he can be happy that Darling backed him up. He's charging so hard, it could have been a really a routine, easy play for him. And he, he elects to go one hand with it, and it takes a little bit of a bad bounce. Remember early we talked about it. the ground crew did a great job in getting this field ready but they really had to put a lot of topsoil extra sod on it because of what they did when they clinched it 
And Darling, a good in, uh, a good fielder as a pitcher, backing up to play, and they get their man at first. If you're scoring, Knight did not touch the ball. It is basically a one-four sacrifice. And now here's Wade Boggs, Henderson at second, two runs in, two nothing Boston. Boggs lined out to Santana in the first inning. Right. If you were just looking at the defense, you would say they're not going to give Boggs anything slow to hit. They'll show it to him. Look how far over Hernandez is. They expect him to hit from center field to the left field line. It looks like they're going to try to make him hit that sinker. Oh, and one. Amazing tribute to Marty Barrett, the kind of a series he's having. Pitching carefully to Boggs with two out, and Marty Barrett on deck. One and one. Ball two. Henderson, the way the infield is, the only man who might bird dog him at all is Tim Tuffle, and he's far away. So you can look at the infield dirt and you can see where Henderson is winding up. He is taking a lead of almost 45 feet before he stops. Two and two. Mark on the runway, you could just about measure it. So two balls, two strikes, two out to Boggs, two in. This is his favorite count, and Darling's been thrown that sink to the outside part of the plate. And as a hopper by the diving Santana, Mookie's going to come up throwing, but Henderson, because of that big lead, will score easily. And it is three to nothing, Boston. With two men out, he's able to get that big lead in the scouting report. And talking to Frank Malzone and Sam Mealy, they they're going to run on the. Met outfielders. Santana tries to knock it down to keep it in the infield, but there was no way that Henderson was going to slow up. As soon as that ball gets to the outfield, the scouts told him, take off. It's still kind of amazing when you realize it. With a runner in scoring position at two out, they pitch to the major league's leading hitter. And he drives in the run. He may have widened that zone a little bit as we watch Henderson score to knock in that run. And here is Marty Barrett. Right. Barrett flied to right in the first inning. Three nothing Boston on two home runs. A walk sacrifice and since they pitched to Boggs he singles it in. And Barrett bunts up along third it's staying on the grass base hit. Once it, it grabbed that grass, it was going to stay there. It looked like for a minute it was going to get to the dirt part. Had it gotten there, it would have rolled foul. There's no way that would stay fair once it hits the dirt. But when it grabs that grass, now right about there, it looked like it was going to go foul. But once it hit the grass, it's almost like little fingers, like octopus grass. He just held it. And Marty Barrett, say what you want. There he goes again. He's in the middle of it for the big guys. And left-hander Sid Fernandez loosening up two on two out and Bill Buckner becomes the eighth man to come to the plate in the second inning Buckner single to right in the first inning the darling on four days rest has been hit hard plus the bunt single Remember two of the outs in the first inning. Bob's lined hard at Santana and Rice lined deep to Strawberry. One and oh. And that's going to be hit to left center, but Mookie on his horse and flags it down. However, the Red Sox get three and leave two. And at the end of an inning and a half, the Red Sox three and the Mets nothing. The importance of this play, if Strawberry had held on to the ball, the Red Sox would have scored one and not three. This ball is out of the strike zone. If Boggs hits, he really widens the zone. 
And watch, Mookie is in shallow, but it's what Malzone and Mealy were talking about. Run on uh, Mookie, but you can see Henderson was only about two steps past third base. So the scouting report really helped score that run. Three to nothing, Boston. Gary Carter to start it off, and he bunts down to get it is Hurst. Full turn, and the throw got him. And that's the best fastball Hurst has thrown in three games. He really reared back and pumped that one because the bunt was a good one. And with Bob's back, Mets are trailing by three. You expect Carter to really take a big cut. He catches everybody except Hurst by surprise, and does this big guy crank a fastball? Look at that. So Carter nipped at first on the bunt, one away, and Darrell Strawberry the batter. Ball one. And Finn, with that pitch, Hurst has only made 11 pitches, and he's got four outs. One ball and no strikes. High fly ball into shallow left. Jim Rice has plenty of time to get there. Darrell Strawberry now all for his last 10 here, dating back to game three of the playoffs with Houston. Two down, and Ray Knight the batter. Boston three, Mets nothing in the second. Two down, bases empty. On deck, Kevin Mitchell. who scored the winning run in that somewhat bizarre game Saturday night. Strike. Bruce Hurst came into this game with a World Series ERA of one. One ball, one strike. One and one to Ray. Well, two. Fastball and a one hopper into center. Base hit for night. Bangs one up the middle with two down, and Kevin Mitchell coming up. Here's the pitch that Ray Knight hits. It looked like a fastball. It was a fastball. Got a three-run lead. Hurst. He wants to stay away from the base on balls. He challenged Knight, and he lost. Kevin Mitchell with Rafael Santana on deck. Bruce Hurst is trying to win his third game of the World Series, and that doesn't happen very often. It has happened 12 times in history, but only four times since 1920. Harry Brookeen, Lou Burdett, Bob Gibson, Mickey Lolich. Dropped in there, strike. Three runs, five hits for John McNamara's band. No runs, one hit for the Mets. Check swing and a roll of wide of first to Buckner. He will do it himself. So the Mets, no runs a hit. They leave one. It's 3 nothing Boston at the end of two. We'll be back after these messages from your local station. Sox got the most out of the second inning to enjoy a 3 nothing lead. Jim Rice, Dwight Evans, and Rich Gedman coming up now against Ron Darling. And the curveball is whacked to left. Going back on the ball is Mitchell, and it short hops the wall. Rice for two, the throw in, and got him. Mitchell. 
Mitchell knows the ball's over his head. He plays the carom just perfectly, and keeping with the motif of running on the outfielders, Mitchell uncorks a strong throw, and Tuffle makes the tag on Rice. Look at Wendelstead on both knees making that call. You talk about being in position. So a base hit to left off the base of the left field wall. 7-4 of you scoring from Kevin Mitchell to Tim Tuffle. That was your classic hanging curveball. It wasn't just it hung up there. Breaking ball up. Dwight Evans the batter. And it is apparent in the early going from the moment that Wade Boggs opened the game with the line drive at Santana that it is a shaky start for Ron Darling although there is no one throwing in the bullpen. He's only had one pitch going for him so far. It's been that hard sinker and he's really had to spot it because when he got to uh, Evans he was sitting on it and boomed it. There's a breaking ball lifted to straight away shallow center. Mookie Wilson there. Two down. That'll bring up Rich Gedman. Who hit the home run in and out of Darryl Strawberry's glove in the second inning and turned it from a one run inning to a three run inning. And you might remember throughout the series we told you how Darling and Gedman battled each other in high school. And finally Gedman has hit one strike. On deck, Dave Henderson. I've never seen so many players with that stubble like we got now. Hernandez didn't shave. Gedman hasn't shaved. It's the Sampson theory, I guess. Ground ball back of first. Keith will bring it to the bag. So thanks to the strong and accurate throw of Kevin Mitchell, the Sox are gone in order. And at the end of two and a half, three-nothing Boston. We're going to the bottom of the third inning at Shea Stadium in New York. The Red Sox three, the Mets nothing. Rafael Santana will start it off. Then Ron Darling and Mookie Wilson. And of course all that went down like broken glass in the second inning. Ball one. During the regular season, the Mets gave left-handers a bad time, but not in the World Series against Bruce Hurst. Ball two. In the regular season, they beat left-handers 27 times and lost to them only 11. Better than 700 ball. In there. Two and one. So Hurst trying for his place in the history books. And the Mets trying to come back. Fouled off. Two and two. See how nice he was? He asked Gedman, are you all right? He got a foul tip. If that ball would have laid in front of home plate, they would have checked the ball. But the pitcher's worried about the catcher. Two and two. Fouled away. Of course, he hit a home run. That's when they're really nice yeah. to you. Three runs, six hits for Boston. No runs, one hit for the Mets. A two-out single by Ray Knight. After that pitch, and down he goes. So Santana becomes strikeout number one for Bruce Hurst. Looked like a breaking ball. It was not that big overhand curveball that he throws. It could have been that fork ball. It broke down off speed. When he throws that slow, big breaking curveball. He really gets those hitters out in front. There is Ron Darling. And he drives one to right and deep. Evans was shallow. He's on the track to make the catch. And Darling, who is considered a pretty good hitting pitcher, takes Hurst a long way. Two down. Now Mookie Wilson will use up a little time to let Darling get back to the dugout. Mookie grounded out, first ball swinging. He rolled it to Marty Barrett, 
leading off the first inning. Any way to kill time, ask the umpire how your family's doing, anything. And Buckner had made a trip to the mound. Tim Tuffle on deck. A little high with a fastball, ball one. Two and zero. Oh. Well, what a long year. The Mets won 115 games along the way. The Sox 102, and it has come down to tonight. Fouled off, two and one. Fastball hit to right. Evans going back, full turn, makes the play. The so Mookie takes him deep, but they're gone in order. Are the Mets and at the end of three? Red Sox three, Mets nothing. You don't really have to be a crowd psychologist to realize the spirit of the crowd that was at fever pitch when they were chanting when Marty Barrett was hitting that sing song is gone. Now they're sitting quietly as the Sox took that three nothing lead in the second inning. If you are a statistician it might be interesting to note the crowd perhaps has the same feeling as you have during the regular year the Mets won 80 percent of the games that they scored first in. And they're three and zero in games in which they scored first in postseason. But it's the Sox on top, three nothing, and here is Dave Henderson. He walked and came around to score in the second inning. Then Owen and Hurst and hit him. So Henderson trots to first with nobody out. Owen coming up. And by comparison, as far as the number of pitches as we watch Henderson yeah, yeah. get drilled. Darling has made 57 pitches. He had 55 after three innings. Hurst in three innings, 29 pitches. So Darling, a shaky early going and a strong performance by Bruce Hurst. And you have Owen Hurst and Boggs coming up. Sid Fernandez is up for the second time in the Mets bullpen. Although Darling did have his at bat in the third inning. So it is Fernandez they look to in the early going and not Dwight Gooden. Spike Owen popped to short in the second inning. A little pop fly to Rafael Santana. Knight is really looking for bunt in tight at third. And instead he hits it right at Strawberry. One away, Henderson holding, and Bruce Hurst, who sacrificed in the second inning, no doubt asked to do it again here in the fourth. And a third baseman Knight and first baseman Hernandez setting up the defense. As we saw the last time, Knight really charged hard. The ball got by him, and Hernandez, who, as always, he sets up whether he's going to come charging in or come in a couple steps and go back on a particular pitch. He'll be two, three pitches into the hitter Hurst, but Knight is already in about five steps. It's going to be a tough job for Hurst to get him over. And if Hurst does get him over, once again, Davy Johnson will have to wonder about even pitching at all to Boggs. Never mind, don't give him anything good to hit. He hit a ball off his ankles for a base hit and an RBI. There's the bunt, and Knight has to go to first. Now let's see what they do with Boggs. And it can't be that situation. It so many times you hear when you go out on a conference on the mound is don't give him any uh, ball to hit. Davy Johnson on his way and he's making a hook right now. So Sid Fernandez is going to be called in from the Mets bullpen. And Ron Darling has had it. So they pitched to Boggs in the second inning and he burned them. He will not be burned again. And Darling is gone. Three nothing Boston. 
Ron Darling went three and two third innings, gave up six hits, a walk, and a hit batter. And of course, the runner at second base, Dave Henderson, is also his responsibility. Sid Fernandez will be coming in, making his third appearance of the World Series. He's worked four and a third innings, an earned run average of two. It is a calculated gamble, sending Fernandez head to head with the leadoff man, Wade Boggs. Sid has an above average fastball. He is considered, however, a poor fielder. Wade Boggs against Darling lined out to short and then when they pitched to him even though Darling threw a ball that was somewhere between the ankles and the knees Boggs went right down after it and singled the center for an RBI. And it's no great secret that Boggs really waits a long time before he turns that bat loose and if you think he does that against right handed pitching it's a little bit more it seems like against left hand pitching he usually takes him to the opposite field and they'll set the defense up accordingly. So Sid Fernandez who pitched very very well impressively in fact in relief of Dwight Gooden that was in the Hearst game at Fenway Park now going head to head with Wade Barnes. Ball one again we are watching Henderson he had such a big lead in the second inning he was almost halfway to third as the pitcher was delivering the ball and yet he knows he can get back to the bag. You see him run right out of your picture. And once again, Mookie in center field is uh, far more shallow than Dykstra would be as we look at Henderson. Look how shallow he is in left center field. And they'll take off on the base hit. Doing all. Fouled off. Two and one. Boston three. Mets nothing. Two out, top of the fourth inning. When you stack your defense like that, you better pitch that he hits that way. If he gives him anything slow, he'll pull it. Hernandez is way over. Remember, the base hit was to the left of Santana. In there. Two balls, two strikes, and two out. The way by. Henderson at second. On the curveball, three and two. He made sure that thing wasn't close, though. And this time in under the hands to put him on. The Boggs walks, and that'll bring up Marty Barrett. And for Davy Johnson. He opted to pitch to Boggs. It cost him a run in the second. Then he made the move to take Darling out and bring in Fernandez, and he still lost Boggs on the walk. Barrett flied to right and had the bun single in the second inning. Marty is one for two. Ray Knight very deep at third. He is not looking for Barrett to do it again. Not with two on and two out. Right. They just moved Mitchell over. Mitchell was playing Barrett as if to pull, and Mookie Wilson, as you can see, the defense is way over in right center field. A lot of room in left center field. They're stacking it on the right side. They expect to hit that way, and it'll be up to Fernandez to keep that ball in that outside part of the plate. On one. Henderson can't take the lead with Barrett up there that he was able to take with Boggs, because now Santana is almost behind him. 0 oh and 1. One ball, one strike. We really haven't seen a lot of bird dogging by the infielders, though. Mm -hmm. A lot of ball clubs, uh, many times, you just bird dog the guy back, not so much to pick him off, but to cut his lead down to maybe you get a play at the plate on the base hit. One and one. Off speed for a strike. A lot of motion and then the soap bubble and the count one and two. And laid it right on the outside corner. And 
At first base, Wade Boggs, Dave Henderson at second, two out. Two and two. Red Sox left a runner in the first inning and two more in the second. Fernandez trying to get him off the hook here in the fourth. Curveball hit to Strawberry. So the Sox lead two. They have left five. And at the end of three and a half innings, the Red Sox three, the Mets nothing. Three nothing Boston, bottom of the four. Then the Mets try to get something started with Tim Tuffle, Keith Hernandez, and Gary Carter. They have just one hit, a single to center by Ray Knight, and that came with two out in the second inning. Of course, if you remember, Saturday night in that wild game, the Mets were no hitted for the first four innings. Tubble popped up to the right side to Marty Barrett in his first at bat. One ball, one strike. That's the first big curveball that he's thrown where he really rainbows it up there. And followed by the fastball for a strike. One and two. And another fastball, and the count remains one and two. He joined us late in the second inning. The Red Sox had back to back home runs by Dwight Evans and Rich Gedman. Gedman ball in and out of Strawberry's glove. Henderson walked, and a two out single by Boggs made it 3 0. And a big overhand pitch takes care of him. For Hurst, his second strikeout. He's got three pitches, and he's not afraid to go to any of them. He just changed speeds on the breaking ball. He's way out in front. The one down in the fourth. Keith Hernandez, the batter, hit the ball hard, but at Dave Henderson in the first inning. On deck, Gary Carter. One ball and no strikes. Outfield about as straight away as you can play a hitter. In there at the knees, one and one. Seems like Hernandez has made up his mind to hit up the middle in uh, Saturday's game. Fly ball to center field, single to center, fly ball to center field. His first time up a line drive, he tomahawked it to center field. It appears that when you do that, you're just hanging in there a little bit longer. One and one. And the curveball has hit the right center. Evans is digging to make the catch. The Dwight Evans has made three of the last four putouts. That was a slow curveball, and you can see Hernandez really wait for the break and then jump all over it and hit it hard, but Evans was there to make the play. Here's Gary Carter, who led off the second inning and tried to butt his way aboard. Watch the curveball and he just hits it very hard, but Evans, been very busy, really almost made it a routine play. Ball one to Gary Carter. And he was looking fast ball, and he was a little bit out in front of it. One and one. Three nothing Boston. Fourth inning, two out, bases empty. Started to say, man, you can almost scout Carter by watching television. Outside part of the plate, changing speeds, just keeping it out there from the middle of the plate over. 
One and one. And he hits that pitch over to Marty Barrett. And so Carter is gone. The Mets are gone. And that's seven in a row retired by Bruce Hurst. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. Gedman is the fourth man in the inning, but here's what Fernandez did against Gedman in Boston. When they talk about climbing the ladder with a fastball, watch this. That was about letter high. Now here's the second strike, a little bit higher. Now you got him set up. Here's the third one. He just climbed it perfectly. Well, we'll see when Rich comes up. He's due to bat fourth in the inning. Just first how Fernandez pitches him again and whether Gedman has learned anything. Bill Buckner single to right and lined out to center. One for two. Right. Three nothing Boston. Top of the fifth inning. Buckner, Rice, and Evans. High fly ball to right field. Strawberry is there. Looking up into that suit. One away. As you watch Fernandez pitch, you, you got to know that his motion is a big part of his effectiveness. It seems like he falls forward after he releases the ball, but that really isn't the case. When he pitched in the Dodger organization and briefly with the Dodgers, he curled up so much on the mound it really looked like he was throwing uphill. And the first thing Mel Stottlemyre did was make him stand a little more erect. Boy, oh boy, you talk about a first ball fastball hitter being challenged. That was reduced to the fundamentals. Hit it. He had it in a pretty good spot. He struck Rice out in one inning of work of this year's All-Star game, and he has him on two. I wonder if he'll do what he did with Gedman. That was about letter high if he's going to climb that ladder with him. 0-2 oh to Jim. Got him. He just flew him away. That is the first. Sox player to strike out Jim Rice and with two down bases empty the batter is Dwight Evans. It is three nothing Boston but when you look back at that second inning if Strawberry had held on to the ball it would be one nothing Boston. Darrell unable to make the great catch. And the Sox turned it into a three run inning. Off speed for a strike. Evan home run in the second inning, fly to center in the third. Spinner in there for a strike. Oh and two. He changed speeds on both pitches, the straight change, and then he took something off the curveball after just throwing nothing but fastballs to Jim Rice. Oh and two. Got it. And that brings the crowd to its feet. And we'll see if a Mets pitcher can wake up the Mets hitters. 3 0 Boston. Because of its importance, here's another look at the great effort by Strawberry. He's gloved it and it's popped out and he looks in his mitt to find out it wasn't there. It would have taken a great play, and he came as close as you can come to making it. And now he leads it on. So Fernandez has awakened the crowd by striking out Rice and Evans. We'll see now as Strawberry leads on. Right. Strawberry flied to left in the second inning. On one to Darrell. And you can see that Hurst is giving it just a little bit extra. He wants to strike out here because he knows that that'll just stop a lot of things with a strikeout. Ball two. The most successful Mets hitter against left-handers is on deck, Ray Knight.
Big overhand curve missed. Ball three. Do you remember Saturday night, Strawberry had two big walks. says he has it and he's true to his word long out one away the dimensions here 338 down the lines to 358 371 and then 396 and that was the neighborhood where strawberry just hit it 410 to straightaway center but it's a graveyard out there especially without any wind but we saw both Evans and Gedman hit him out tonight in the second inning. Ray Knight singled for the Mets only hit. Whether it's indicative of anything it should be pointed out. The Mets have had some long drives by Darling Wilson Hernandez and now Strawberry. One ball no strike. In there. Kevin Mitchell on deck. One and one. Hit off the end of the stick foul and the count one and two. Well, as you can see, the Football Giants against the Redskins, same score as we got here. Three nothing just starting the second quarter. Think Washington has any hits? I don't know. At least one. Gotta have one. One and two to Ray Knight. Fastball. Two and two. We're in the fifth. Three nothing Boston. One out, base is empty. First has retired eight in a row. Bouncer over the mound, charging Spike Owen. Gets him. It's nine in a row, and it'll bring up Mitchell. Mitchell grounded to Buckner in the second inning. who were there at the moment said in that wild madcap scene in the Mets dressing room following Saturday night's game the one player who was completely calm was Kevin Mitchell one and one it was Kevin who scored the run on the wild pitch Brown foul to Buddy Harrelson in the count one and two. Waiting his turn on deck, Rafael Santana. Pass ball, fouled off to the right, out of play. Still one and two. Hurst is really spotting the ball well in and out up and down great control of it of the location of the pitch when you talk to a scout about that they say well he's got good control of the strike zone Hurst leading three nothing in the fifth. Got him. And so whatever momentum built up in the top of the fifth when Rice and Evans struck out 
has been dampened considerably. Tonight's game is brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by the makers of Prestone 2 Antifreeze. Don't push your luck, change it with fresh Prestone. Gedman leads off, and remember we showed you our game within a game. The last time Fernandez pitched against him, it was high fastball. Started him about the letters and just kept climbing that ladder. Let's see what he does this time. And remember, too, that Gedman has the reputation of being a high ball hitter. Identical. Right at the letters. See if he comes back a little bit higher. No balls, one strike. Ron Darling went three and two third innings, charged with three runs, six hits. On oh two. So far, it looks like an instant replay. Strikeouts for Sid Fernandez, Jim Rice, and White Evans in the fifth. Getman to open up the sixth. He didn't quite climb the ladder, but he stayed with his fastball. Sidearm, he made Getman give a little bit of tough pitch to hit, and he got the big strikeout. Here's Dave Henderson walked and hit by a pitch. Looking ahead, Sid Fernandez is due to be the second batter in the bottom of the sixth inning, but there is no one throwing in the Mets bullpen. Santana, Fernandez, and then Wilson are due up in the bottom of the sixth. One ball, no strikes. He's got to be tough to pick up. He's one of those pitchers, I'm sure, when they go back to the bench and say, hey, he's quicker than he looks. That ball's in on you before you know it. One and one. Hindu walked and scored in the second inning. Ball two. Fernandez, remember, was fourth in the National League in strikeouts. He was tied with Dwight Gooden. High fly ball into shallow left center. Mookie says he'll have it. Two down. Here's what Fernandez looks like with that motion. You can see him really bearing down on the target. Looks away a little bit and then. He really takes a big stride and comes down. Looks like he releases the ball and then finishes, which has to be deceptive. It's a, it's a tricky motion. He can be a remarkable pitcher. His high 14 strikeouts in the game. He has retired six in a row. A foul out of play. And then he's not trying to do it with trick pitches. He's just rearing back and firing. 0 and 1 to counter Spike Owen, who popped a short and flied to right. Two out on the sixth. Boston three. New York nothing. One and one. Bruce Hurst out on deck. One and two. It has to be habit, but Cardi checks everybody that comes up. I doubt it's Mike Owen will be trying to sneak a peek. Crowd making the kind of noise it normally makes for Dwight Gooden. They want another strikeout. Off-speed curveball, got him looking. Four strikeouts and seven in a row. 
We talked about Hurst and his ability to control that strike zone, the location. Watch what he does to Mitchell when he strikes him out. Just pay attention to where the pitches are. This is a fastball. He fouls it off. Fastball, low, fouls it off. Breaking ball in the same spot and strikes him out. It looked like the fastball last minute she darts in, and although he had a good cut, didn't come close to hitting it. If you wonder about the Mets in the bottom of the sixth inning, they are going for the pinch hitter. Lee Mazzilli is on deck to bat for Sid Fernandez. And Roger McDowell is in the bullpen. Strike one to Rafael Santana. Of course, it was Mazzilli who appeared as the pinch hitter in the eighth inning Saturday night and scored a run that tied up the game. One and one. Santana struck out in the third inning, and there's Roger McDowell along with Vern Hoshite. Fastball, and it's hit up the middle behind the bag, and here comes Spike Owen to get him. It looked like the ball was going to get through. Here it is from the center field camera. It's over the head of Hurst. And range is what makes this play on. Finishes up on the second base side and gets his man easily. Buckner again coming to the mound now with Mazzilli up there. Hurst, by the way, is on a roll now. He has retired 11 in a row. The only time he has had to work out of his stretch was with two out in the second inning. And Ray Knight had gotten a base hit. Ball one. So Sid Fernandez worked two and a third innings, and he gave the ball club a big lift from the mound by striking out four and retiring seven in a row. And now Mazzilli batting for him. One and oh. Mookie Wilson on deck. Ball two. And Mazzilli by faking the bunt, it looked like he's going to try to push it past the pitcher. At least drew Marty Baird in a couple steps at second base. Right. Two and one to Lee. And it's hit over Buckner's head foul down the line on the count two and two. Once again, we remind our viewers we'll be selecting the NBC Miller Lite player of the game at the conclusion of this ball game. And that brings up another interesting note. Thinking that Saturday night would be the conclusion of the series, Bruce Hurst was already named the World Series most valuable player. However, the Mets pulled off the miracle because of the rain. Hurst got another chance to pitch. And now he's really working for the award, just as they're working on that right field fence. Two and two. One out, six inning, three nothing Boston. And it's hit to the hole, base hit for Mazzilli. Just trying to get a piece of it, and Mazzilli put it between the shortstop and third baseman, and he's on. And John McNamara knows that Hurst has only allowed two hits, so he's not showing any concern. Wilson has gone the other way twice, grounded to Barrett and flied to right. They are not holding Mazzilli. Buckner is back of him, and now he has to run in front, consequently, the collision. Now, See Buckner sneaking behind him, and Mazzilli just kind of bumps him. Not a bad play. Line drive into left field. Base hit. And the Mets are alive with one out in the sixth, and Tim Tuffle coming up.
Burns, Elliott second, Wilson at first, one out in the sixth, Steve Crawford in the bullpen, 3 nothing Boston. Tuffle has popped up to Barrett and struck out. Doing one. Took something off the pitch way out in front. Wilson at first, Mazzilli at second, one out. Hernandez on deck.
Evans making a diving, smothering attempt. And we had to wait till Dale Ford indicated catch and then no catch. And that's why Hernandez is hollering, why didn't you call it? It looked like he had it. It was a delayed call. He had it in the glove. You see it pop out. And as he turns, he sees it. Hernandez is still at first base, and Keith really upset. And now Kibler explaining to him that he call it as soon as he can, but Hernandez is not buying it. But he gets the hero greeting for driving in the two runs and setting up the time run to score. It is 3-3 in this madhouse call Shea, and the batter is Darryl Strawberry. Strawberry, 0 for 2, fly to left and fly deep to right center. Carter on a fielder's choice if you're scoring from Evans to Owen, 9-6. They could regroup and come up with another dandy after Saturday night, but there is Calvin Chiraldi, and we're 3 3 in the seventh inning.
Armis followed by Boggs and then Barrett. Sinker got him. McDowell just rears back and throws his best pitch, which is the sinker. It starts at about the knees, tough to lay off. And when you try to chase it, it's out of the strike zone. But with two strikes, Armas was trying to get a piece of it. Where's Boggs, who lined to short, hit one about at the ankles for a line drive base hit and a run batted in. Last time up, walk. Right. Three runs, six hits for Boston. Three runs, four hits for New York. Strike. Little chopper to third. Knight waits for the hop. Guns in the dirt. Dug out by her. has to wait for the big hop he throws it low but watch Hernandez not only is he digging out he's in front of that ball it was not going to get by him that's a short hop a tough play a classic picture if he misses it it hits him in the leg and now he says to the umpire I caught it Here's Marty Barrett. Flied to right, bunted for a hit, flied to right again. A chopper over the mound. Here comes Santana. Got it. At the end of six and a half, all even at three. With the crowd screaming, take me out to the ball game. A brief moment in the Mets dugout. Hernandez and Carter. And we go to the bottom of the seventh. Three, three. Oh, is it wild here? <laughs> that's the way. That's the way it should be. Uh -huh. Two clubs battling down the line. It's the seventh game of the World Series. Going into the seventh, eighth, and ninth innings. The nine toughest outs in baseball, and and everybody up on their feet. Calvin Chiraldi, the former Met, coming in to try and stifle the Mets. Bottom of the seventh inning. On deck, among others, as you see, Orozco. Knight will lead off, but Mitchell is going to give way to Lenny Dykstra. So it's going to be Knight, Dykstra, and Santana. And remember, Backman is in the game, having run for Tuffle. Knight singled and grounded out. He is one for two. You know, we have seen Calvin Chiraldi in so many pressure packed moments in the league championship series with the Angels and in the Red Sox. You might forget his first ever major league save was in August. I mean, he's just starting. On one. One ball, one strike. On deck, Len Dykstra. Ball two and the chant.
it is four to three New York in the seventh and Len Dykstra the batter for Kevin Mitchell. The first home run at home hit in this World Series by the home team. And you hear so much about concentration. Ray Knight was quoted saying he was once told that concentration is the ability to think about nothing. So he certainly was up there loose and really ripped a high fastball. Ball three and Sambito and Stanley are throwing in the Red Sox bullpen. Tell you the last two will kill you. <laughs> Dykstra really tried to get down lower than normal to try to get that base on balls. Three and one. Line drive, base hit to right field. Here's another look of Ray Knight's home run launched over the wall in left center. It looked like it was a belt high fastball. And Chiraldi, the minute it was touched off, knew it, and there's his reaction. And watch Knight coming around. And what a welcoming party he had. It is so noisy at Shea, you can't hear the airplanes. You think you're out in the country. And Bill Fisher is out to the mound. And I tell you, with all this and Dykes running first base, don't be surprised if he takes off on the very first pitch to keep it going. By the way, as Johnny McNamara looks at the lineup cards, when the Red Sox come up in the eighth inning, they will have Bill Buckner, Jim Rice, and Dwight Evans. Rafael Santana, the batter, and he'll be fouled by Roger McDowell. And Boggs looking butt on the grass. I think I'd pitch out just to stop everything, but you have to worry about Chiraldi's control. the Meadowlands, Vin. They tell me when they put the score up there, the noise was so great that the players they had to stop the play. I can believe that. One ball and no strikes. Dykstra at first. The Mets are two for two with pinch hits by Mazzilli and Dykstra in the sixth and now seventh inning. A better throw might have gotten him. He was far off the bag. Oh, he wants to go. He wants to keep it going. The, the merry-go-round is on full speed, and he wants to make it go faster. Santana has not been called upon to bunt with the pitcher following very often. He has only one sacrifice. And again, Dykstra taking liberties. That's about as big a lead as the law allows. He's right about at the uh, the beginning of the straight line as far as the grass. There's, it's cut at an angle to give the first baseman more dirt, but right at the start of where it's a straight line, right about there is where he is. That's a long way out there. One ball, no strikes. Dykstra not going on a pitch out and it's a wild pitch. Dykstra to second base. Gedman gets out there but I mean he is way off the target with the uh, pitch out. It's a play you practice and there is Bruce Hurst looking on. And now Gedman going out to talk to his pitcher. He's going to have to settle him down because, I mean, the wheels have come off. And, of course, John McNamara can think of the hit batter involving Brian Downing. The wild pitch Saturday night. The wild pitch tonight. 2-0 to Rafael Santana. Dykstra second and nobody out. Punched inside first and down the line. 
Dykstra will score on a single by Santana. It's a manufactured run to the extent that Santana was going to at least get the ground ball to the right side. Chiraldi jammed him with the fastball, but trying to hit it to the right side, he gets the base hit. And, of course, Dykstra, looking like he was going to steal, gets the pitch out wild pitch in scoring position, and they still have it going. So it is five to three minutes. And here is McDowell a strike. Calvin Chiraldi has faced three batters. He has given up a home run and two singles, a wild pitch, and two runs. And the Mets have jumped out in front. McDowell not sure of the signs from Harrelson. Oh, and one. Bunt. Foul ball. We mentioned it earlier. With these two, you never know. Counting the League Championship Series and the World Series, the Mets have come from behind 44 times. That includes tonight. 44. But on the other side of the diamond, you have a ball club that won 19 times in its last at bat, including the playoffs, the Boston Red Sox. Ball one. And Boston must be thinking, remember the 10th inning. Saturday night, we were leading 5-3. to three. Now it's 5-3 New York, bottom of the 7th. The bunt to Buckner. No play at second, the out at first. I thought he had a play at second. I thought he had a play. He looked and all of a sudden decided not to go to second base. In fact, Barrett is stuck in behind first base, so he was well protected. In fact, I thought there was a play on, and you can watch it. Now, Buckner, I think, gets it in plenty of time. He's got a play right there. Man, Santana really he still had a play after double pumping, but he took the sure out. I don't know whether the grass was wet and slick. He didn't have a grip or what, but Calvin Chiraldi has lost his grip, and he's gone. It is 5-3 Mets in the seventh. One out. We'll be back. Bob Stanley on the outside looking in. Watching Joe Sambito walk Mookie Wilson intentionally with Wally Backman, the switch hitter, coming up. What an awesome moment here, especially if you are a visitor, to hear 50,000 people in unison chanting and singing we will we will rock you and they are rocking shade Backman has not been much of a hitter right handed. That's why he didn't start against Bruce Hurst. But he's hitting right handed against Sambito with Hernandez on deck. Santana at second, Wilson at first, one out, five three Mets in the seventh inning. Way outside. Great save by Rich Gedman. Or you have runners at second and third. Looked like a case of just overthrowing the ball. Getman ready for anything, and he gets out there and makes a play like much like a first baseman. So two former Mets. First Calvin Chiraldi. Now Joe Sambito on the griddle. Ball two.
strike. You've got to believe he's taking this one too. They want to get Hernandez up there. In the inning, Knight Homer, Dykstra single, took second on a wild pitch. Santana singled him in. McDowell sacrificed, and Wilson was walked intentionally. Three and one to Backman. On the corner. He's taken all away, and that's the way they play, and that's the way they should with Hernandez coming up next. Santana and Wilson checking with Buddy Harrelson to see if they'll play run and hit. I would hold him. One out. And Backman asking for time. Backman, who is not effective as a right hand hitter. So if he strikes out, you'd run out of the inning and you take the bat out of Hernandez's hand, so we'll see. He's a tough man to double up. Three and two. Runners will hold. Fouled away. Five runs, seven hits for the Mets, including the home run by Ray Knight. Three runs, six hits, and no errors for the Red Sox, who had back to back home runs by Evans and Gedman back in the second inning. But since those back to back home runs in the second inning, the Red Sox have had just one hit after the second inning. They have stopped completely, thanks to Sid Fernandez. He's the one that gave them that thing called momentum. Three and two. Runners hold. Ball four. It was Hernandez who was 0 for 2 when he came to the plate in the sixth inning. And with the bases loaded, single to left center to drive in two. Bob Stanley is probably getting ready to pitch to Gary Carter. Hernandez tries to hang in against that left-hander and take him to the opposite field. He was able to do that to Hurst. And now he's facing another left-hander, Sambito. Santana at third, Wilson at second, Backman at first. One out, two in, 5-3 New York. Time. High fly ball to center. That's plenty deep. In fact, Wilson and Santana tag. Santana will score. Wilson to third, 6-3 New York. And John McNamara will now bring in Bob Stanley to pitch to Gary Carter. Three runs charged to Bruce Hurst. He does not have a decision. Three runs charged to Chiraldi. He will have a decision unless the Sox can come back. It is 6 3 New York, two out in the seventh, and we'll be back. for the moment with his head down the Mets leading the Red Sox 6 3 in the seventh inning and Bob Stanley will go head to head with Gary Carter Wally Backman is at first Mookie Wilson is at third and of course it was Stanley who threw the wild pitch that turned Shea Stadium into the madhouse the other night. Carter tried to bunt for a hit, grounded out, picked up an RBI on a force play. Ball one. 
Don't forget the Red Sox will have Buckner Rice and Evans in the top of the eighth. Fifty five thousand and thirty two at Shea it sounds like a hundred thousand. Chopper to Owen to play got him at first otherwise another run but the Mets come up with three more and at the end of seven the Mets six and the Red Sox three. This telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. What we have now is a brief show of strength to the 55,032. The policeman on horseback along with police in the stand. By inference telling the crowd they will not allow the exhibition that occurred here when the Mets clinched the pennant. That bullpen has been turned into a horse pen. That's where they are, and they're going to come out. What a show of strength. There they are in the bullpen. And we can only hope that if and when this crowd celebrates, they will be dissuaded from any wild acts. Because from what they tell me, when the Mets won the pennant here, it looked more like sharks at feeding time. However, the Sox have six outs left with Buckner, Rice, and Evans coming up in the eighth inning. And Roger McDowell, who is in his fifth game, five of seven, pitching to Buckner. Right. Bill Buckner single to right lined out to center and flied to right but those at bats were against Ron Darling. The Sox jumped out to a three nothing lead and there's a looping single to left. That's only the second hit for Boston since the second inning. So they just stopped completely and the reason they stopped so completely was the performance by left hander Sid Fernandez in the fourth fifth and sixth innings. There as you can see the newcomers Backman of course came in having run for Tuffle in the sixth inning. Dykstra taking over in center and Wilson moving over to left. Out away. Jim Rice. Trying to get his ball club back in the ball game. As we mentioned earlier, Rice has only had five at bats in the entire series with a runner in scoring position. Fouled away. And he led off the inning. One out of three at bats tonight, so just about half of his at bats in the series, he's been the leadoff man. And he's going to be in trouble doing that. And with McDowell pitching, they don't expect him to pull the ball. They're really bunching him up the middle. On deck, representing the possible tying run, Dwight Evans. Rice lined out to right, so he can take a sinker ball that way. Single to left, and then struck out against Sid Fernandez in the fifth inning. One and two. Two and two. It happened in threes tonight. The Red Sox got three in the second inning. The Mets got three in the sixth. The Mets got three in the seventh. And Washington got three in the half. <laughs> two and two. Line drive gets on by as it explodes and McDowell now is in trouble a low ball pitcher against a low ball hitter who represents the tying run Dwight Evans and nobody out 
He got that pitch up to Rice. They had him played pretty well. The defense was there, but he hit it so hard it just got right on by. And you can see the ball is up. A sinker baller can't pitch there. And Santana, even at that, almost came up with it. And now it is strength against strength. In the Mets bullpen for the second time, left-hander Jesse Orozco begins to loosen up. Evans homered in the second, fly to center, and struck out. Buckner at second, Rice at first, nobody out. Ball one. On deck is the left hand hitting Rich Gedman. And Orozco in the wings. Strike. One and one. David Johnson made a pinch running move uh, when he put Backman in. You wonder if McNamara is thinking about Buckner at second base, at least pick up that run. It's going to be tough for our Buckner to score on a single. There's no speed at all out there with Buckner and Rice. And that's going to be hit into right center field. That's a base hit. And even Buckner on one leg will score easily. And let's watch Rice. They're going to wave him in. Backman has no play, and the Sox have come back with two, and the Mets' lead is now 6-5. And the tying run is at second base with nobody out. Evans really plugged the gap in right center field. Dykstra in center field, shedding him a bit towards left center, a lot of room. And watch Buckner, he sees it fall, and here he comes. It rolls all the way to the fence, and Buckner able to score, as did Rice, easily. And when you can score Buckner and Rice without a play, and Backman had no play whatsoever, you know that ball was hit deep in the right center, and that's going to be all. Roger McDowell, who has appeared in five of the seven games, has had to leave. Jesse Orozco will be coming in to pitch to Rich Gedman. Hold on to your hats. We'll be back. Jesse Orozco making his fourth appearance in this World Series. His earned run average is 0 0. 8 and 6. He was whispering before the ball game that he had a sore throat, but that his arm is fine. We've got an identical situation here when Santana was up there with the man on second base, uh, Dykstra, after the uh, pitch out wild pitch. He tried to hit the ground ball to the right side, ended up with a base hit. Getman is in that same situation. He has to try to pull that ball, at least get the ground ball, to move Evans over to third base with one out. He's got to pick up a base with the out. Rich Gedman homered off Darryl Strawberry's glove in the second inning when Ron Darling was pitching, grounded out in the third, struck out in the sixth, you remember, on three pitches by Sid Fernandez. Davey Johnson wants to talk to John Kibler for the moment. Gedman was really looking at uh, Rene Latchman, and the Mets even halfway looking for the bun here, maybe all the way looking. Now Kibler wants to talk to. Harry Wendelstadt. trying to get lucky and read some lips but it didn't work. If Hernandez gets that ball he may go to third base. He's in close back when he's back at second. The bench was hollering at Ray Knight and he's come up he's about even with the bag at third now. So the tying run is at second base nobody out and Orozco going head to head with Rich Gedman. Six five Mets eighth inning. Gedman all year had one sacrifice. 
Orozco's not sure of the signs at all. And I tell you, in a spot like this, you'd almost say, hey, one's a fastball, two's a curve, no trick plays with uh, Evans on at second base. And you, you know what I think? What? I think maybe Dave Davy Johnson wanted to find out about instructing Orozco on a bunt situation, and yet would that constitute a trip to the mound? That could be what they were talking about. Now they're going to appeal a play here. missing a third. No, says Joe Brinkman. Well, why would he talk to Kibler and Wendelstead? And why would they wait 30 minutes to do it? Okay, it's six five Mets, time run at second, nobody out. Gedman followed by Henderson. And then Owen. Big sweeping curveball. Owen one. Of course, if you get that slow curve, that's about the best pitch you can handle to get a bunt. But I don't think McNamara is thinking bunt. Well, Roscoe is thinking one thing. He's got to go for the strikeout. On one. Him and that was violated the other night. Bunt at home. He bunt to win on the road. Well, Gedman hacking away 0 2. 0 1. What you just said was according to the book. Right, but and the bunt is gone. That's right. The other night, first and second, Johnson decided not to bunt because Howard Johnson didn't look good on the first attempt. So that book, forget it, it's been burned. One and two to Rich Gedman. And he's going to hit a line drive at Backman over to Santana. Not in time. Boy, was that close. And I'll tell you one thing, Santana had a little heat to handle on the dead run. Backman fired it. Good play by Santana. And good play by Backman and a great play by Dwight Step Evans. Up. You can see he started to lean and Backman, he really guns it over there. Santana very alertly there, but Evans, a good piece of base running. So Gedman line drive at Backman, one out. And of course, that's a very expensive out late in the game. If he makes an out, if that ball hits the ground first and he's able to move his man to third, you'd have the tying run 90 feet away. If you're wondering about Don Baylor, he is on the steps of the Red Sox dugout. The steps. There he is. So one out. Evans at second. Six five Mets in the eighth inning. Anderson walk was hit by a pitch and fly to center. And the way they're defensing Henderson, Evans at second base would be able to get a pretty good size lead because he'll be able to watch the second baseman Backman. You can see they're playing him the pull. Knight will guard the line. And Santana near the hole, and you can see where Backman is, so Evans can keep an eye on him and get a pretty good lead. Single by Buckner, single by Rice, and a double by Evans to get the Sox back in the game. That's lead, 6-5. Dirt blocked nicely by Carter and Evans has to hold it second. Once again, Carter keeps that ball in front of him, and there's nothing Evans can do. And when you see that ball in front of you, the first rule is don't go anywhere. You'll watch it here. Henderson getting a lot of curveballs. Remember, he took Aguilera deep for the home run in the 10th inning Saturday night. One and two. Don Baylor to bat 
for Spike Owen. There is a rascal throwing the curveball. There was no way Henderson was going to see a fastball. The target was the back, the right kneecap. And Carter making the save on that one that bounced there was a big play at that time at bat because the rascal comes back with the strike. And now they're having a big meeting on the mound as to what they're going to do with Baylor. Baylor has had 10 at bats in the series. He has two hits. One of the two hits a double and one run batted in. So the man who became the designated sitter in the National League now comes up trying to get the Sox even. And the key of course. Gedman's line drive at Backman. Time run Dwight Evans at second base. Henderson stay away from the fastball, show him the fastball, make him hit the breaking ball. And Orozco's best pitch is a slider. And he started him with the slow breaking ball. Ground ball to the hole. That's where Santana was playing him. Got him. Two runs, three hits, and the Sox lead the time run at second base with nobody out. 6-5 New York. Yes. It is head-shaking time for a frustrated and disappointed Don Baylor as we go to the bottom of the eighth inning, 6-5 New York Mets, and this is the epitome, the pinnacle of all baseball to get the final game of a seven-game World Series, a one-run game, and the home club coming back to take the lead, and the visiting team really making a run. And both clubs really battling. So far, the difference has been the Santana ground ball, which went for the base hit. In the bottom of the eighth inning, two changes for the Red Sox. Al Nipper is on the mound, and Ed Romero is at shortstop. If you're keeping score, put Nipper in the number eight spot, occupied by Owen. And put Romero number nine, so he's due to lead off in the ninth inning. The Sox got three in the second inning, but maybe the turning point, certainly emotionally, was the job that Sid Fernandez did to stop the Sox, inspire the crowd, which in turn seemed to inspire the hitters. And here's Strawberry, fouled away. And he had to do it twice, Vin. If you remember in that fifth inning when he ended by striking out uh, Rice and Evans, the crowd was really up, and then Hurst came back, and he shut the uh, Mets down, and... Fernandez came back and did it again in the sixth. Brown foul to Bill Robinson, 0 and 2. It's been Bruce Hurst, Calvin Schiraldi, who is the pitcher of record, Joe Sambito, Bob Stanley, and Al Nipper. The Mets have used Ron Darling, Sid Fernandez, Roger McDowell, and Jesse Orozco. And one of the big questions will be whatever happened to Oil Can Boy?
take to Ray Knight. Knight who singled to center, grounded to short, and homered in the seventh inning. 7-5 Seven, New York. And if you are young Darrell Strawberry, you must sit in the dugout and think, take your Darrell, Darrell. And the place bombarded now with rolls of paper, which will do nothing but slow it up. Knight will be followed by Lenny Dykstra. Here's another look at that skyrocket, a towering drive that went out at about the 370 sign, and he knew it immediately. It'll take him about 20 minutes to go around the base pad. Oh, he really took his time. It was one of those majestic home runs, a towering drive, and he was going to enjoy it as much as anybody. That's the look in game five when the whole right field stands. It took him a while, but he answered them tonight. Up the middle, base hit for Ray Knight. In the Red Sox dugout, as Renee Latchman charts every pit. To look ahead for Boston, they will have Ed Romero, Wade Boggs, and Marty Barrett. And the Mets hitters are trying to lighten the load for Jesse Orozco. Here's Dykstra. Dykstra batted for Mitchell in the seventh inning and singled to right. That's when the Mets broke the 3 3 tie. One and all. Looked like a knuckleball. The Mets won 115 games up to here. The Sox had won 102. And the payoff is tonight with three outs to go. Right. One and one. Santana on deck. Two balls, one strike. so magnificently won twice went six innings and had his team even when he came out he is not involved with the decision but he's the youngster who was voted the MVP and of course he'll lose that award hit up the middle but in motion is the shortstop Romero who is breaking the cover and by being in motion he takes a hit away from Dykstra Knight into second base. Looks like it's going to get through there, but Romero was breaking to cover second base and was in perfect position and really turns it into a routine play. Rafael Santana, who had a key hit in the seventh inning when he singled inside first base to drive in Dykstra. One for three. And it was a good pitch that Chiraldi made to Santana, who was trying to hit the ground ball and be sure he picked up the base if he did make the out, but he jammed him. Santana swung and got it between Buckner in the bag and drove in a big run. Santana struck out, grounded out, and then single. They are going to walk him intentionally with a Roscoe coming up. And a Roscoe might very well be asked to bunt, and Mookie Wilson would then come up. Used the bun as a defensive play to the point to stay away from the double play, which would end the inning. 
again while we have the moment the Red Sox are due to send up in the ninth inning Ed Romero Wade Boggs and Marty Barrett and remember the Red Sox won 19 games including the playoffs in their last at bat so like the Mets they show and have shown remarkable resiliency. Orozco has only had three at bats all year and he does not have a sacrifice and a meeting at the mound. I'd almost bet the house that he's going to bunt the ball. Oh, yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's what they're talking about. Lay the ball in here and maybe we can make a play at third. So Al Nipper, he was the man who was sent to the mound in John McNamara's calculated gamble. And the Mets eventually won the game six to two. Nipper went six innings and allowed three runs in that game. And now Nipper, in the eighth inning of the seventh game, somehow trying to restrain the Mets from opening up a 7 5 lead. He's bunting. Ball one. What they do is, as you can see, they're really squeezing the plate. Ed Romero is breaking to cover the bag at third. That allows Boggs and Buckner to come full tilt towards the plate. Orozco is not sure. He doesn't get up that much. Harrelson's going to make sure, but again, he's got to bunt. He has to bunt to keep the inning alive. Strike. And that time Romero and they were setting it up. Romero, instead of racing for third, circled back to second. One and one. Ray Knight at second. Rafael Santana at first. One out. Swinging and a ground ball into center field. In comes Knight. It is eight to five Mets. And Joe, you just lost your house. Davey Johnson, I tell you, is living a charmed life. He's the only guy in the ballpark that thought he should hit, and it paid off for him again. That had to be an invitation, of course, with Boggs charging the plate, Romero breaking to third. There just wasn't anybody there capable of handling a ground ball. And Orozco does it perfectly. He just puts the bat on the ball, and everybody's moving. The closest man was Marty Barrett. And you've got to take your hat off to Davey Johnson once again. He walks that fine line. He did it the other night by not bunting when Howard Johnson got away with it and gets a big base hit here. John McNamara bringing a hook with him. I believe he'll go to Steve Crawford. And we shall return. Darryl Strawberry jeered in Boston, frustrated here when the ball went off his glove. And a hero. And on the other side, a very bitter moment for all of the Red Sox. It is eight to five, New York. Now I saw a line by Louis Grizzard that really captures that picture. He said, "Losing hurts worse than winning feels good." Well, boy, it sure hurts worse in the Boston dugout. Listen to this crowd and that chant. was Al Nipper with his face buried in the cloth the dramatic shot and reminding you of Calvin Schiraldi's sad moment in Anaheim. If you're wondering Jesse Orozco has been in the big leagues five and a half years he had ten hits 
High slicing foul. Off third, down the line, back into the crowd, out of play. So in the inning, Strawberry homered, Knight singled, Dykstra grounding out, advancing Knight. Santana walked intentionally. Orozco singles in Knight. And Mookie Wilson against Steve Crawford. Ten hits in five years. Why not let him swing? <laughs> With that kind of managerial strategy, Johnson ought to be buying lottery tickets after the game. <laughs> oh, and one. Hit him. He, yep, he goes to first. And that will load the bases. Mookie's quick, but that one nailed him. It was Mookie, you remember, at the plate on the wild pitch. Saturday night. Here's Saturday night. The pitch that didn't hit him, thrown by Stanley, that went to the backstop. So the Mets have loaded the bases. The infield has to play up. The Mets leading 8-5. Ground ball and a broken bat. Barrett to the plate for the force to Gedman. And Santana is erased and everybody moves up 90 feet. So Backman is at first. Wilson is at second. Orozco has reached third. And Santana out. Watch how sure Marty Barrett makes the play. He looks, finds his man, and throws a strike. Two out. They're picking up the pieces of that shattered bat. And here's Keith Hernandez. Al Nipper remains motionless in his grief in the Boston dugout. For Hernandez, it's his third at bat with the bases loaded tonight. He singled to drive in two in the sixth. His scoring fly ball picked up a run in the seventh. And here he is with a full plate in the eighth. One ball and no strikes. Eight five New York bottom of the eighth. Strike. Joe Brinkman the third base umpire but John Kibler had already called it a strike anyway one and one. Crawford, the sixth Boston pitcher. Giraldi is still a pitcher of record. And there's one hit and short hop by Barrett. Keeps it in front of him and throws to Buckner. And the inning is over, but the Mets get two more. And at the end of eight, as the champagne gets colder, the Mets eight, Red Sox five, and they're three out from pulling the court. The culmination of the impossible dream in 1969, a fly ball to left field for the last out, and the Mets are the world's champion. What made it interesting, the batter who made that last out is right there, the manager of the Mets, Davey Johnson. He was also the last player to get a base hit off Sandy Colfax in the 1966 World Series. But now let's see if the Sox have anything left. They rallied gamely in the eighth when they were down by three. They had two singles and a double to get within one, and they left the time run at second. Now in the ninth, Ed Romero, Wade Boggs, and Marty Barrett against Jesse Orozco. The way the pattern of the game has developed, truly the guys who got the Mets here are out there at every position. With Hernandez and Backman and Santana and Knight and Wilson and Dykstra and Strawberry and Carter. One and one. Popped it up. 
It will be home. Carter or Hernandez, Hernandez. Tonight's game is brought to you by AT&T, the right choice. By the American Express card, don't leave home without it. By Kentucky Fried Chicken, we do chicken right. And by Miller Genuine Draft, cold filtered for real draft smoothness. It's beer at its best. And the Sox, who are a strike from elimination in Southern California, who look like they had a lock at game six, are now down to their last two outs. And here's Wade Boggs, one for three. When this game ends, we will visit both clubhouses and we will have tributes to each team as well we should as each team merits a tribute. And we had said as we look at Dave Henderson and a somewhat heartbroken Red Sox bench that it was the best of times and the worst of times. That was the tale of two cities and that's the way the series would end. Fouled away one and two. Ron Darling with his arm draped over Sid Fernandez and Fernandez has to be the unsung hero. No question about it. He's the one that gave him the momentum. One and two to Wade Bonds. Check swing foul into the stands. And Jim Rice who was frustrated in 75 because he couldn't play. Two for four tonight. One of his two outs a line drive out to right. And he is frustrated tonight. Curveball, big chopper to Backman. Hurry to Hernandez. The executive producer of NBC Sports, Michael Weissman. The coordinating producer for NBC Baseball and tonight's director, Harry Coyle. The telecast of tonight's World Series, produced by George Finkel. Pre-game produced by Les Dennis. Pre-game directed by Andy Rosenberg. Technical directors Lenny Stucker, Stephen Semino, and Ken Harvey. And there is a smoke bomb on the field. And timeout. in the ninth inning and this crowd of fifty five thousand and thirty two bursting their buttons to make some noise but hopefully that will be all standing in the way is Marty Barrett and Mookie Wilson out in the midst of all that smoke no so timeout. An oil can boy who was supposed to pitch game seven, and then the rains came. And Wade Boggs, the major league's leading hitter, can just sit and think of what might have been. Still not really ready, and there is no breeze to help, but it is dissipating. Bill Buckner is on deck, but it will be up to Marty Barrett to keep the Sox very faint hopes alive. Barrett, two fly balls to right, a bunt single, and grounded out. His honor the mayor standing in the back of that line of Mets. One ball, one strike.
They have planned a ticker tape parade for the Mets tomorrow if they win tonight. They're going to check it first. No swing, says Jim Evans. to strike and the Sox are down to their last strike and this crowd is really ready to reach the heavens now. This crowd will tell us what's happening. French tonight's NBC Miller Lite player of the game we feel is left hander Sid Fernandez. Miller Lite is happy to present a check for $1,000 in the name of Sid Fernandez to the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Two and a third hitless innings with four strikeouts. Friends, the World Series locker room is brought to you by Ford Division, who congratulates the 1986 world champion New York Mets on an exciting World Series. And of course, our thanks as well to the Boston Red Sox.
tonight we are in the victorious Met Clubhouse, even as we look at Wade Boggs on the Red Sox bench. Commissioner Ubaroff, the manager of the ball club, Davey Johnson, the general manager, Frank Cashin, and for the presentation of the trophy, Commissioner Ubaroff. Very quickly, I'm uh, pleased to tell you that there's a wire from the President of the United States congratulating the Mets. He's watched all the games. He's very happy to congratulate you, and he's invited the entire team, everyone from the organization, to the White House. Well, that's very nice, and we certainly will go, and we appreciate that. Let me tell you, it's very special, very special for baseball, and I'd like to present you right now and this, and this great big guy, if I can, his trophy. Yeah, where's Freddie Wilpont? Fred Wilpont was going to be... Freddie? Looking for Fred Wilpont, one of the owners of the ball club. Davey, you take it. You're stronger than me. Davey, it's a heavy one. Great. I, think I, I think I can hold it. Seven games, you did it all the way. Congratulations. It doesn't get any better than this, Peter. No, this is what it's all about. <laughs> Frank, we'll start with you. You were the architect of bringing this ball club along in a few years' time from a last place team to a team that won 108 during the regular season and now reigns as world champions. Your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are that we had great ownership. Mr. Wilpont, Mr. Doubleday give us the time to really rebuild this ball club and people like Al Harrison and Joe McElvain and Steve Shriver and Harry Miner plus Davey and some great ball players, we were able to do it. So we'll always be appreciative of the ownership and uh, it's great to be a winner as you know and I thank the fans of New York and the people everywhere that supported us. Let's get a word here from Davey. Strange and unfair as it might seem, if one thing or another broke a different way Saturday night, you come up short and some people, unfair as it would have been, would have said failure. Well, that's what this game's all about. You can never take anything for granted. Strange things happen. You just keep plugging away. And it happened for us. We deserve it. We, we had the best record in baseball. We should be the world champs. Your thoughts about the Boston Red Sox? They're a great ball club. It, it, you know, it was very touch and go, both, you know, break here, break there, and they could have been world champs. But the good guys got it. Is there any way to describe the roller coaster? Two out, bottom of the 10th Saturday, and you're standing here now? Well, that's baseball. That's what makes it so beautiful. You know, it's never over till it's over. I think somebody said that. And uh, this is what it's all about. This is what it's all worth sweating for. Davey, congratulations. Thank you, Bobby. A quick word from Fred Wilpon, one of the owners of the ball club. Bob, I'm very thrilled. I'm thrilled for New York. I'm thrilled for the New York Mets. Boston Red Sox have nothing to be ashamed of. They played great baseball, great character on both sides. Frank Cashin and his organization here is, I think, the best of baseball, and I love him. I love him for New York. We're going to try and get Ray Knight up here. Before we speak with Ray Knight, the most valuable player, we're going to go to the other side, to the Boston Clubhouse and Marv Albert. Marv? All right, Bob, and uh, this man to my right, Bruce Hurst of the Red Sox, who had a splendid World Series, winning two games, not able to do it tonight, but on Saturday night, at one point, you were actually voted most valuable player of the series before uh, the game was over. I know this has to be a difficult moment for you. Well, uh, you know, it's, <clears throat> I'd rather trade all that stuff for the World Championship. Uh, we battled hard all year long, and uh, we came back, and um, today we, we tried, but we just didn't have enough, and you have to tip your hat to the Mets. Um, they came back, we beat them the first two, and uh, they showed a lot of class and a lot of guts, and uh, they have a lot of great players on their team, and you just have to give them credit. Bruce, of course, this is 1986, uh, but ball players are very superstitious, and you look back to the Red Sox of 67, of 46, of 75, and people say they are snake bitten. What is your reaction to that? Did that have any effect on this ball club? None whatsoever. Uh, what happened in the past doesn't have any bearing on what happened today. Uh, we had every opportunity to win. Uh, we had a chance to win on game six, and we didn't put it away. And uh, we were in the game today, and then we just let it slip away. Uh, what happened in 46 and 75 and all those other years, it doesn't make any difference. It's a totally different ball club, different players, whole different cast of characters. And uh, this team can win. They'll be back. All right, and we're told that Ray Knight won Most Valuable Player Award uh, in the series and the last two games, uh, he's the man who did most of the damage. He's a very good player. I felt like all along for me to win, uh, he was one of the guys that I had to get out. He's a great great hitter. He's a great two-strike hitter. He doesn't strike out a lot, and uh, he's an outstanding player, and I have to tip my hat to Ray. He, he did a great job for them and, and beat us. All right, Bruce, thank you very much. And Ray Knight, the series MVP, is alongside Bob Costas. Let's get back to the Met locker room. Marv, thank you. And just a moment ago, Ray, Davey Johnson was saying, 
it's just baseball. It's the way it is. You can go from goat to hero, from the bottom to the top, and it happened for you certainly in such graphic fashion. It surely did, man. I, I tell you, I was so down the other night after the era, but this is a game of redeeming features, and thank the good Lord, uh, I had a chance to come back, and we won that ball game tonight. Just goes to show if you keep fighting in there, things can happen, and that's the way it's been for me all year, and just a great bunch of guys, and golly, I, I don't really know what to say. I'm just so excited and happy, and, and this is unbelievable. The home run that snapped the tie. Well, it was a fastball, two and one. I was looking for a fastball tie ball game, and um, I'm a fastball hitter, and I just looked, uh, pitch uh, up and kind of in the strike zone. He threw it right there, and I had a good swing at it. I don't hit too many of them, but I knew that was gone if he was up enough. <laughs> What did they say to you? Can you remember it all when you hit home plate and then the dugout? Boy, the last two nights, I've, everything's been pretty numb for me. My concentration level's been so high. Uh, they just hugged me and gave me high fives and all that, and I don't really know what they said. I was just uh, emotionally spent again. I, I've been exhausted the whole last couple of nights. Boy, that's cool. Woo and uh, just, uh, just the feeling of when they touch your hand and all that stuff is such a um, feeling of uh, uh, togetherness and closeness. I, they really said a lot, but I don't remember what they said. Congratulations on being named MVP. Thank you very much. Unbelievable. Let's get, let's get Keith Hernandez in here. You deserve it. Keith, I, I was thinking as you came to bat in the sixth <laughs> inning with the score 3-0 and the bases loaded, in 82 in the other World Series in which you played for the Cardinals, bottom of the sixth at Bush Stadium, trailing 3-1 bases loaded, left-handed pitcher on the mound. An almost unbelievably identical situation, and you also got a base hit there. Well... I remember that well. I tied the game and it was two outs at the time. Uh, I felt Bob, I swung the bat great the whole series. And everybody was saying, well, you're not hitting the ball. And I said, well, you can't look at the box scores. I've been hitting the ball good the whole series and right at people. And I woke up this morning, I told my brother who was with me from California, Gary, I said, if I get a chance with men on base today, I'm going to be the man. And it just worked out great that way. I was, uh, at a bat, I was so confident and relaxed. I was just up for that at bat. It was a, you know, it's a situation you, you thrive on, but I didn't have any butterflies. I was real, having my great concentration. On Saturday night, after you made the second out, and you're down by two runs in the bottom of the 10th, you went into Davey Johnson's office, and tell us what happened then. Well, I went into Davey's office. I figured it was the last at bat of my season, and uh, our season. <laughs> and I, I grabbed, a, grabbed a Budweiser. Augie Bush will love that. And drank a drink of Bud and sat in Davies' director's chair. And we got two hits. And then the third hit, I got a run in. And all of a sudden, the tying runs on base. I ran in my locker and got my glove. And then I said, I was going halfway out the door going to field. And I said, no, that chair's got hits in it. And I stayed right there. And that was a remarkable comeback. Congratulations for being part of a world champion. I promised my, my three daughters I would say hello. Jesse, Melissa, <laughs> and Mary Elise. And my sister-in-law, Mary Horn. They're behind us all the way, and I love them. I'll see them in a week. As that and from the champagne shampoo, we go back upstairs to Vin Scully. And meanwhile, down on the mound with Kevin Elster on his feet and other members of the Mets, it has evidently been a ritual. When the Mets clinched the division, clinched the pennant, why they sat on the mound, several of them. And tonight, there are those who remembered Rick Aguilera. And then, of course, we can see Howard Johnson and Kevin Elster is there and there is Ron Darling and they walked out with large bottles of champagne and of course it's not for drinking I think they spill much more than they ever thought of drinking and now the crowd salutes them as they can say truly we are number one.